Hello, I'm Svetlin Nakov from Softuni, the Software University. Together with my colleague George Kirgiev, we shall teach this free Java Foundation course, which covers important concepts from Java programming such as arrays, lists, methods, strings, classes, objects, and exceptions, and prepares you for the Java Foundation's official exam from Oracle. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain and demonstrate the primitive data types in Java, how to declare, initialize and use variables, and how to perform time conversions from one data type to another. He will explain the integer types, int and long, the floating type, point types, float and double, the text types, char and string, and the special types, boolean and object. Along with the live coding examples, your instructor will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience with the mentioned coding concepts. Are you ready? Let's start! Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the soft unit jet system, where you can get instant feedback for your exercise solutions. Soft unit judge is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or wrong. I'm sure you will love the judge system once you start using it. Let me show you how you can submit the solutions from your hands-on practical exercises to the automated grading system, the so-called soft unit judge. So you have a judging system designed to send you your code and it tells you whether the code is correct or not. And I will show you how it works. You open this link and you go on this, uh, on this uh, website where is in the soft unit judge and you click, click practice and you have this full Java full foundation course. These are the, the problems. And here you, you put your code just like it's shown here and you submit and you send it so for example let's the first problem student information is this one and this is your solution in java and you want to check whether your solution is correct or not you click submit and it appears here so you can refresh in few moments and it tells you whether your code is correct or not if you put some incorrect code for example uh, I will format incorrectly the age and the grades of, 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 the, uh, of the output. And when I click here, it tells me that I have all the tests wrong. And in this case, I can click the details and I can see that it, the expected input is like this. Uh, the, and my output is this one at, at the right. I have one additional digit which is which should not be there. So this is how the judge system works. It will be your best friend when you are learning uh, Java through our training courses because uh, as I repeat many times, uh, learning Java is mostly coding and less watching videos so you need to practice that's why we have prepared a lot of coding exercises for you and please do them because i want you to become java developers before the start i would like to introduce your course instructors svetlin nakov and george Gurgiev, who are experienced java developers senior software engineers and inspirational tech trainers they have spent thousands of hours teaching programming and software technologies and are top trainers from SoftUni. I'm sure you will like how they teach programming. Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer and today we will be talking about data types and variables. Now, by this point you already know what variables are, but we haven't formally been introduced to them in connection to the data types they have. So today this is what we're going to cover. Now, what are we going to start with? We're going to start with uh, what data types are and how do they relate to variables in Java because in different programming languages some concepts are different uh, depending on whether the, data, whether the programming language is statically typed like Java or not, like JavaScript. So we will be talking about that. We will discuss the integer and the real number types, meaning integers and double and float. 
We will also be talking about type conversion, meaning how you can convert from one data type to another with and without losing data. We will be talking about the Boolean data type, which we've seen when we have made comparisons with uh, the comparison operators when we're doing, uh, for example, an if condition. Whatever you place in that if condition is actually an, a variable of the Boolean data type. So we will be discussing that. And we will be discussing the character and string data types and how do they relate to each other and how we can use them. So let's talk, let's talk about data types. What actually we need to know about data types is related to how computer uh, science uh, operates on information and on how computers actually access information. So. Computers in their most basic uh, form and their most, more, most general description are just machines that process data in some way. They, they process information. They, they get information from somewhere, they um, do some operations on it, and they output information somewhere else. So uh, to, to handle this information, to process this, this information, computers need to store it somewhere. A computer needs to have a place where it puts information and then works on that information so it can give the results uh, it gives after its computations. So what typically happens is you have some uh, data coming in, some information coming into a computer. That information gets con converted into computer memory through uh, using the binary numeral system, i.e. you get ones and zeros in the computer's memory. And that, those ones and zeros are actually uh, stored into transistors, which are the computer's uh, basic memory unit. Each transistor has either an on state or an off state, meaning it either, uh, that's simplification, but let's say it either has current flowing through it or it doesn't. It's more complicated than that, but simply put it, the, there's an easy way in electronics to represent two values, uh, uh, a, a 1 and a 0, let's say, and that's why computers use the binary numeral system to represent information because it's easy to uh, implement in electronics from an engineering perspective. So the hardware limits the way computers uh, access data to 1s and zeros. So a computer contains all of its memory is 1s and zeros. Now, how it handles the information it has determines the data types we're using here. So, ones and zeros are ones and zeros. They don't care about what you're representing in them. It, they're just ones and zeros. But how we handle those ones and zeros, how we treat a bunch of ones and zeros, determines what uh, operations we can do on those ones and zeros. So, when you have a bunch of ones and zeros sitting somewhere, what you can do with them is create a variable for them, name them in a certain way, and set the, that variable's data type. So when you have uh, a piece of memory like, for example, 00000101, here's a piece of memory. This is actually a single byte because it contains eight bits, eight ones or zeros in a sequence, one after another, and this actually is the binary representation of the number 5. So this is the number 5, our decimal number 5, uh, in, the, in the binary representation. So 101 zero, one is 5. Now how that formula, uh, how, how we get from 101 one to 5, how, how does the formula work, we don't really care that much currently, but simply put, you just add powers of 2 where you see 1. So here you, you add the 0th power of 2. So this is a index 0, this is index 1, this is index 2, this is index 3, and so on. Well, whatever the index is, you if there's a 1 there, you just add 2 to the power of whatever the index is, whatever the position is. And then over here we won't be adding anything because there's a 0. And then over here we will be, we will be adding 2 to the power of, since this is index 2, well, to the power of 2. So that's two, 2 to the power of 0 is 1, plus 2 to the power of 2 is 4, and that gives us 5. Okay, so that's how an integer would be represented, an integer number, a positive integer number would be represented uh, in memory in a computer. But if that exact same memory is of a different data type, 
it will be treated in different ways. So if we tell that piece of memory to, uh, get, to get assigned by the value 5, that's what we're going to see in, in the first byte of that memory. So we're going to see exactly that uh, 1, 0, 1 sequence. However, if um, the, the exact same sequence is interpreted as another data type, it will be some other thing. It won't be the number 5, it will be, uh, for example, a symbol. So, some symbol from the uh, ASCII character table. So, when we talk about variables, we actually, and, and specifically data types, we actually talk about not different storage into the uh, computer. What we're talking about is different ways of treating that storage, different ways of treating a sequence of ones and zeros to get a different representation in the, for example, on the console. Okay, so you assign variables, and you know that already, by using the operator equals. So if you want to assign an integer variable uh, named count with the value 5, just like we had, uh, in this case, the byte containing the value 5, what would happen is an integer variable will be created, the memory for an integer variable will be created, that memory will contain exactly four bytes for integers in Java, we will uh, cover this a bit further on, but four bytes will be allocated in computer memory, each of these will have eight bytes, so this will have eight bytes, this will have eight bytes, this will have eight bytes, and this one will also have eight bytes, so uh, eight bits, sorry, eight bits, a byte contains eight bits, and the integer data type is a 4-byte integer representation. So when you say integer, that's 4 bytes. Every integer you create assigns 4 bytes of uh, computer memory to your program. And assigning a value to these bytes will set the uh, appropriate bytes to the appropriate uh, values so that they match the binary representation of the number 5 in this case. So this is what happens when you create a variable. Creating variables actually allocates memory, meaning it takes memory from the system and gives it to your um, program. Okay, so this is uh, an allocation of a 4-byte integer on memory, and this is what happens when we assign it a value. The sum of the bytes in that memory change, so they represent the value from uh, our program. So what... Uh, what we call an integer, an int here, is the data type. This is called a data type, and this is the variable name in this case, and this is the variable value. Okay, so if you do any operation with this variable, in order to keep the result, you need to either write it into the same variable or write it into another variable. So doing operations on data requires you to save them back into memory. Each operation a computer does needs to be saved back into memory or otherwise printed on the console or sent over the network or something so that that value is contained. Otherwise, what happens is that the processor creates that value and if there's nowhere to send it, it just loses it. Okay, so the data type, in this case integer, in this example integer, a data type is just a domain of values. It's, it's the type of values and the way we treat them that uh, that determines the data type. And it's it's not even the type of values, it's how we treat those values. So the same ones and zeros can be treated like an integer, they can be treated like a character, they can be treated like a string, they can be treated like a floating point number, and so on. It really depends on the data type you're using, but otherwise, underlying all of it is just the binary numero system and ones and zeros in transistors in computer uh, parts. Okay, so each data type, from the point of view of a programmer, is a domain of values. So you see, the, you see a data type as the possible values a variable can get if it is uh, initialized with that data type. So if you initialize something with the integer data type, you know that this variable can get values which are integers, positive and negative integers in a certain range. We will discuss that range later on. Okay. So, for example, we can store 1, 2, 3, or minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Um, those would be the integer data type. If we want to store characters, we would be using the character data type, which is written like this, char or char. Uh, you, you can find different uh, uh, readings of this uh, type. I would just call it char for now because it's easier to read like that. 
but this is the character data type that's where where char comes from okay and you could also have monday tuesday and other uh, real world objects into uh, your programs and we will see how we can add those to our programs later on okay so what does a was a, what does a java data type contain well it contains typically a name the name of that data type for example integer uh, string um, enumerations uh, character flow double bytes uh, short and so on it has a size each data type in java has a specific size which represents it meaning how much memory that uh, data type uses i already mentioned that the integer data type has a size of four bytes whereas the char data type has a size of two bytes okay and it also has a default value now these default default values will come into play when we talk about arrays or when we talk about objects from for now these default values we can ignore creating a variable directly will not initialize it with its default value so these default values we don't really care about for at this for this uh, uh, part of the lessons we have okay so integer is a four byte integer represent uh, a four byte representation of an integer number if we say int this is a primitive data type primitive meaning that all other data types uh, all data types which are not primitive are based on the primitive data types a primitive data type is a data type that can be directly um, processed by the cpu so it, it's just a sequence of uh, bytes which are uh, usually a representation of a number in one way or another so primitive data types are data types which are just chunks of uh, information and int is one of them float is another double is another string however isn't a primitive data type uh, we will uh, discuss that in detail later on okay so it takes up four bytes or 32 bits and we'll uh, talk about that later on and its default value is zero Typically, the default value of each primitive data type will be either zero or something that resembles zero, that, that is effectively zero um, in computer memory, meaning just a sequence of zeros and no ones is bits. Uh, and that, that rule applies for the floating point data type and it also applies for the character data type now what does it mean for a character to be zero zero well we will discuss that when we reach uh, the part of the lecture that discusses characters okay and since we've already created some variables it's a good idea to now discuss how we name those variables so we match the conventions in java now every language has some conventions about how variables should be named and depending on the language you're using, you should be using that convention, that the, or at least the common convention in that language when you're naming your variables. In Java, what's accepted is that variables are camel case, meaning that each word is connected to the next word without any separators like underscore, for example, or uh, something else. And each word in the in the variable name is capitalized except for the first word so the first word has a small uh, a lowercase letter and each of the next words uh, in the word in the variable name is capitalized okay so yes camel case okay, because it looks like a camel with a hump in the in its middle now you should try to name them with nouns and possibly adjectives plus nouns so uh, if you're having um, a variable which is mm, preferred weight or something or uh, preferred color you know preferred is the adjective and noun is color so uh, or just a noun for example apples or students or number of apples that also kind of follows the adjective plus noun concept you have uh, a descriptor of what the next word means but these over here don't uh, really pay that much attention to them you will get used to um, the examples we're giving in our lessons and those examples will be descriptive enough for you to um, to to sort of parrot what we're doing in your variable name so the most important thing is that the variable should explain what that variable contains 
So when I see your code, if I haven't seen it before, I should be able to understand, okay, so this variable is called uh, student, so it, and it's an integer. So it probably contains the number of students uh, which have been, for example, read from the console. Okay, so this, these are examples of good names or okay names. Again, how descriptive a name should be depends on the context in which it is used. So if you have a short program, you don't really need that, that much of descriptive names, but it's good practice to try and uh, code descriptive names so that you have um, a good idea of how to do it further on when you um, create larger programs. Uh, and depending on where your variable is declared its name can be shorter or longer depending on the surrounding code for example a for loop which just executes something an n amount of times is completely fine it's completely fine to use uh, just int i there like i short for index uh, because it's something pretty standard in programming and other people will easily understand what you mean however if it's not obvious what your variable means like for example full bar p1 uh, populate or last name like this uh, last name in this case isn't uh, non-descriptive but it starts with a capital L and it would confuse um, potential readers of your code with other types of variables because there are um, things in Java which you name with a capital L in the start and they're called classes and if someone just sees a variable named like this they will be confused whether that's a variable or a class and they would have to look at that variable again and see what it does where it's initialized and so on also in Java avoid uh, underscores like this Java uh, code doesn't typically include underscores in names of variables so avoid them and again these last ones are okay descriptions but they are not okay formatting well as these don't really tell us anything so avoid names like this unless for example for p unless you have some very short piece of code which let's say calculates the area of uh, or the perimeter let's say you calculate you're calculating the perimeter of a circle or of something else well in that case since p is often used in maths you can use p but again it should be a short piece of code a very short two or three lines at most and if it isn't, you should probably name it a bit more descriptively. Okay, so continuing on from here, uh, once we know how we should declare these variables so they are uh, easy to be read from uh, other users of our code, we should talk about something we haven't yet met in uh, programming, and that's scope and lifetime of a variable. So scope is where you can access a variable. When we're writing code, let's open IntelliJ, when we're writing code and declaring variables, let's say we declare a number variable here and say its value is five, five that, va that variable is visible from the start of this main method to the end of this main method. So all of these lines are, um, that, that's actually, that's the, the scope in which the variable uh, is accessible. However, you can actually only, I'm actually talking to you about lifetime. You can only access the variable after you've declared it. So the scope of a variable is actually the uh, method in which it exists or the largest block of code, in, uh, the smallest block of code in which it is placed. And that's, okay, so this, this entire part, and then you cut from that the part to which, uh, the part before which the variable is initialized. So this whole thing is a part of code where your variable isn't visible. It becomes visible to other code once it gets declared like this. So if you have int number, even if you don't give it a value, from here on out, you get the scope of your variable. So the scope begins from the declaration of the variable from the place where you say here's a variable of this type and the scope ends where the uh, block of code in which your variable is declared ends so the scope of the variable ends with the uh, end of the block of code and a block of code is just um, the code between two curly brackets like this one. It doesn't matter if these curly brackets are the brackets of a method or the brackets of a condition or, or the brackets of a loop. 
or the brackets of uh, a class and so on. So every time, every time a variable is accessible within the brackets in which uh, it is created. To access it from other places, you would need, depending on what those places are, you would need different code. So by default, the scope of a variable starts from where the variable is declared and ends where the first closing curly, curly bracket appears, the first closing bracket which matches uh, the opening bracket in which the variable was declared. So if we have an if here and say, uh, let's say number is 5 over here, and we have an if here and say if number is larger than 1, then create a variable int x which is 2, and then we go over here and say system.out.println number. Now, this is uh, code that doesn't really do anything, but we're illustrating a point here. Now, the point we're illustrating is the following. I initialize the variable, and it's visible outside this if statement. It's also visible inside this if statement, and it's visible up until we reach this closing bracket. It's not, however, visible over here. You can't say if number larger than 5 over here. Why? Well, we're in the same block of code, but we are before the creation of this number variable. So this limits the access to the number variable from the start of the declaration onwards. Anything outside that can't access the number variable. Okay, and here we can access number because why well because number is visible from here on out and it's visible until the end of the main method however if we try to print x over here we'd get an error a compile time error why would we get that well because this x variable is declared inside this block of code and it's visible from its declaration onwards to the end of the block of code and that block of code ends over here so because x is declared inside the if statement it can only be accessed from inside that if statement the same goes for loops now an interesting thing is that if you create a for loop from starting from i equals 0 to i less than 10 let's say it doesn't really matter what indexes you pick in this case, if you try to access this i variable, it still won't be accessible, even though it's not between uh, these curly brackets of the for loop. So it's not like the um, if statement. It's still not accessible, even though it's not within the curly brackets. But the reason for that is that uh, the for loop is just a shorthand construction for a while loop, and it kind of cheats. So this anything you initialize over here is only visible between these two curly brackets, only within them, not a, not outside them. So things initialized inside again, it, it's pretty much the same like uh, with conditional statements. Things initialized inside the conditional statement are only visible inside the conditional statement, and things initialized inside the for loop are only visible inside the for loop. Uh, the only specific here is where actually inside means. Inside typically means uh, the curly brackets, but for a for loop it also means these brackets over here. Okay, so that's the scope of a variable and the lifetime of a variable is how long that variable stays in memory. Now the lifetime is the entire block of code in which the variable exists. So it may not be accessible before it is declared, but it's actually in memory from before it is declared. So that's how, the, uh, that's how computer memory treats variables. So if you have a primitive data type variable in double char float and so on, it will take up memory from the moment the code block which contains it starts. Okay. So let's actually play around with that a bit. Let's say we have a for loop and we create a variable in uh, sum inside it and say sum plus equals i and then um, then let then what do you expect in this for loop to happen for the sum variable? What what will the value of the sum variable be? For the first execution, it will obviously start from 0, and then we, we will add i, which is also 0. So sum will be 0. 
what will sum be on the next execution when i equals 1? So let's get to the point where i equals 1. So sum is what? Would it initialize again or would it add i? Now, even though I've named this sum, it doesn't really calculate the sum. Why? Well, because what did we say about the lifetime of a variable? The lifetime of a variable is between the brackets of uh, between the brackets that contain it directly. So, these brackets of the for loop contain the sum variable, meaning that this variable gets created over here, and then its lifetime ends when the loop body ends, and the loop body ends on each iteration of the loop. You know, the loop starts over here, executes this part of the body, executes this part of the body, and then the body ends. And then the body is created again, and executed again, and then the body ends, and so on and so forth. So, what happens over here is that the lifetime of the sum variable is one execution of the for loop. So each time this sum variable is created anew. So this is a new sum variable, it is created, it is assigned the value of 0, and then we add i equals 0 to it, and then i becomes 1, and then the sum variable is created again, and then we add i equals 1 to it, it becomes 1, but then it dies at the end of this for loop. And then it gets created again, sum equals 0, and then we add i, which is 2 at this point, and then sum becomes 2, but then it again dies at the end of this for loop. So if you have something between the cur between curly brackets, it dies whenever these curly brackets get executed, when, whenever the execution point of the program reaches the end of the curly brackets. Okay, so that means that you don't calculate sums like that. In order to calculate the sum, you have to have the sum variable outside of the for loop, and do the calculations inside the for loop. Now, in this case, the sum variable gets increased each time by the i variable, and that gets stored. It, it doesn't get reset again because it's initialized inside the main body, not inside the for body. And then I can use it over here to print system.out.println, print the sum, to print the output. Okay, so that's lifetime. Lifetime determines how long the sum variable lives. And this means that the sum variable, if it's inside the for loop, not only will it not be accessible for print line over here, because its scope will end here, but also its lifetime will end here, and we don't really calculate the sum this way, we just reinitialize sum with the value of i on each execution. So that's lifetime. That's the lifetime of a variable. And here we have an example. Here's a string variable, which is outside uh, somewhere. Uh, it, it's actually outside the for loop, but it's inside the main method. And here we have a for loop, which has an inner string variable, and this is inside the for loop. So this gets initialized each time the for loop runs, whereas outer gets initialized only once. And outer is accessible outside the for loop because it's declared outside the for loop, whereas inner isn't available outside the for loop, and if we try to access it, we will get a compile time error. Okay, now there's another concept which isn't exactly technical, but it's uh, related to quality code, and that concept is span. Variables have span. What does span mean? Well, it means how much time the variable exists before it is accessed. So in my case, my, the span of my um, some variable is two lines, so one line here where it's created, and one line here for the for loop, and then I directly access it. Okay, so this is the span of a variable. Now, I can move this integer i variable outside the for loop, like so, and I can initialize it here, but I can declare it here. In this case, the span of this variable became this line, then this line, then this line, it, it became a lot of other lines, and there's a variable here, which is, it, it intersects the span of the i variable. So, uh, the span, the, the length of your, the spans of your variables determines how easy it is to read your code. So, the shorter the spans, the easier it is to read. You notice that in this for loop, it looks a bit weird, right? So, I have an i variable, 
And that means that that i variable is declared somewhere else, and I need to look for it to see what happens with that i variable before it gets into my for loop. So using uh, using variables like this isn't really recommended. And a good practice is to keep your spans as short as possible. So you create a variable where you need it. You don't create it at the start of your program. You create it wherever you need that variable and use it at, at that place. So for an example, here outer is its span includes all of these lines up until the point where we print it. And we wouldn't we don't really need to do it like this. We actually could move the outer variable here, since it's being used here, and that way it would only have a span of two lines, and it's easier to, to search for it. Okay, so the, the main concept you should take away here is keep your variable span short. If you need a variable somewhere, declare it there. The only exception is if you want to create a sum, and yeah, we need the sum here, but we also need it outside, so try to keep the lifetime and the span of a variable as short as possible. The shorter a variable lives, the easier it is to read because you don't need to look for it in a lot of places. You only need to look for it wherever it is used. Okay, so that improves readability. It's easier to read code which has shorter spans. And here we have more examples. You can check them out later on. Okay, so once we've covered what uh, variables are and what their span is, let's cover the integer data types which we've already used so we can see what their properties are, what their differences are, and so on. So, there are four integer data types in Java. They are byte, short, integer, int, and long. And this, this is the order in which uh, their size increases. So byte is the smallest possible integer data type, and it represents an 8-bit integer. Short represents a 16-bit integer, int represents a 32-bit integer, and long represents a 64-bit integer. Now, do you need to remember these values? No, you don't. What you need to remember is these sizes. And how do you calculate how, how many values uh, a data type can represent? Well, it's pretty simple. Let's say we have a single byte data type, a single bit data type, so one bit, only one bit. How many values can you store in one bit? Well, you can store either zero or one. Okay, how many values can you store in two bits? Well, you can store zero, zero, you can store zero one you can store one zero and you can store one one so four values we can play around with this even further what happens with three bits well you can store zero 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 then you can store zero zero one then you can store zero 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 one zero then you can store zero one one then you can store one zero zero then you can store 101, one, then you can store 110, one, then you can store 111, one, one, and that's pretty much it, right? So these are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 values. Okay, so do you see a pattern here? There is a pattern over here. The pattern is the following. If you have one bit, you can store 2 to the power of 1 values. If you have two bits, you can store 2 to, to the power of 2 values. Right? Four values. One, two, three, four values. If you have three bits, you can store two to the power of three values. So, eight values. Eight possible combinations of ones and zeros for that length of bits. So, that's all you need to remember. You need to remember the sizes and you need to just raise that to the power, to raise two to that power. So, a byte can store two to the eight. Uh, bit, uh, to the 2 to the 8 combinations of bits, 2 to the 8 values, 2 to the 8, yeah, and you, as a programmer you should probably learn the powers of 2, so 2 to the power of 1 is 2, 2 to the power of 2 is 4, 3 is 8, 4 is 16, 5 is 32, 6 is 64, 7 is 128, and 8 is 256. So 256 possible values inside a single byte of information. This represents exactly one byte of information.
Hence, 256 values split evenly between positive and negative gives you from minus 128 to plus 127 and 0. I said split evenly, but since we're including 0, that reduces the maximum uh, integer value for a byte. Okay, compared to the minimum integer value for a byte. Okay, so this is how you calculate the size of a byte. And how do you calculate the size of a short? Well, it's 16 bits, so it's... And you start the calculator. You start a calculator, and that calculator, you input... Uh, you go into the scientific view, and you just say 2 to the power of 16 for short, and you get 65,536. And it's actually pr pretty close to... Uh, the 64 number which we got to, to the 2 to the power of 6, like right? So 2 to the power of 6 is 64, whereas 2 to the power of 16 is about 65,000. So that, that's a mnemonic you can use to uh, remember that. Why, why is it like that? Well, it's because 2 to the power of 10 is 1,000, which is similar to 1. You can think of that as like that. So the powers from 10 onwards are similar to the powers from 1 onwards. So 2 to the power of 2 is 2000 and something, um, and 2 to the power of 1 is uh, um, 2, simply. So um, w w I didn't mean to... Uh, 2 to the power of 11, yeah, I messed, up. I messed that up. So 2 to the power of 11 gives you 2048, 2048, and 2 to the power of 1 gives you 2, right? So they, they look similar. This is to the power of, it isn't 21, this is 2 to the power of 1 gives you 2. So the values are somewhat similar before 10, before the 10th the power and after the 10th power. Okay, so uh, that's it for short. And how does it work for integer? Well, 32 bits are about 4 billion values. And 4 billion split evenly between negative and positive gives you these values. You don't need to remember the exact values. And if you need the exact value for some reason, you can always do, let's say for integer, you can do integer dot max value. This gives you a variable, this gives you a value, which is the maximum value for an integer. So int max equals max value would give you the maximum value for an integer. And if you print this on the console, you will see this number printed. Okay, so for long, it's an even longer, bigger number. Again, what you need to remember is the number of bytes or the number of bits for these data types. And to use the appropriate data type depending on how many bits you're going to need. Okay, so here we have an example of this, uh, of using the appropriate data type for the appropriate maximal values we're expecting. So if we're going to be representing a date in the current century, one way to do it is to represent the number of centuries with a byte, because a byte can represent values from minus 128 to plus 127. So since in, we're in the 20th century currently, it's going to take a lot of time before our program starts working incorrectly, meaning that it reaches the 127th century. So we're okay with storing centuries in a byte if we're going to represent the current day. And storing years in a short because 65,000 years from 65,000 years, we're going to have a lot of time until we get to the year 65,000 since we're currently in the year 2000 or approximately in the year 2000. And days, well, when you get to days, you kind of need quite bigger numbers. And when you get to hours, you need even bigger numbers and so on. So what you can do when you're solving tasks is to minimize the amount of memory you're using by picking data types, which uh, can save lower, va lower values, but large enough values to cover your expectations for the maximum value. So this is sort of an optimization. It's not really done that much, done that often. Uh, people usually use integer for everything because 
there's plenty of memory these days and you don't really need to optimize for each byte. But if you do need to optimize for each byte, well, that's why you have the different data types in Java and those allow you to optimize the amount of data you're storing. Okay, so we won't be playing around with this too much. You can try out creating these variables and see how uh, they work. They're, these data types act the same way that integer does, but the maximum value they can save is less. Okay, and I'm saying the maximum value and the minimum value, and I'm saying that because you need to uh, be aware of the integer overflow problem when you're using lower values than uh, lower data type, smaller data types than the values you're trying to save. So what happens? What would happen if I create a for loop? I create a for loop, but I create I create it not with a with an integer, but with a byte, and I say. Um, Run this for loop until it reaches 130 and say system.out.println i. So print the number which I'm, which I'm at at the moment. Well, if I start this, since byte's maximum value is 127, i will never reach 130. What happens to i actually is you can notice what happens on the console. The console keeps printing numbers, and these numbers rotate from positive integers to negative integers, and positive integers and neg negative integers again. Well, what happens is that if you have a variable uh, by, let's say that's byte x, and that's equal to byte.max value, which is 127, and then you say x plus plus, x rolls around and becomes, it overflows, this is and uh, integer overflow, integer as in the type of number, not as in the uh, data type int. So what you get here is an integer over, overflow, overflow, and that causes your byte to become, to jump from the maximum byte value to the minimum byte value. So if we place a breakpoint over here and start this program, we will notice that x is now Let's see, minus 128, that is byte dot min value. What actually happens is you can imagine um, the data types in the following way. You have uh, zero over here, and then you have sort of a circle which reaches for byte 127, and then it jumps onto minus 128 and then that goes back to zero so if you're increasing a value and increasing it and increasing it a byte value and you reach 127 if you add one to that it moves you to the minimum value min minus 128 now why that works the way it does is based on how uh, how numbers are represented in binary and it's got to do with something called two's complement and you can google that to see why the uh, the plus operation works that way but that's simply uh, how computers imp implement integer numbers whole numbers so by the way that means that if you're at 127 and you add 2 so if you say add 2 that would give you not minus 128 again, it would give you minus 127. And the same rules go for integer and long and uh, short and so on. All, it's uh, absolutely the same thing. So if you overflow the integer, you get the negative values. And by depending on how much you overflow it by, you will get that integer value, that offset of integer value. Okay, so be beware of this, be careful with this. So when you're uh, working with close, close to the maximum value of your data type, well, you probably should uh, change to the next larger data type and use that. Okay, so that's what you do for integer data types and that, that's why you have to be careful because this loop over here will never finish. It will keep executing until I reaches uh, until until the end of time, until we stop the program. It will never reach 130. Okay, so uh, 
you keep this in mind and you again the advice is use integer most of the time integer is your go-to data type for integer numbers it's also optimized to work with the processor architecture uh, of your computer so you should be fine using integer most of the time but uh, be wary of uh, larger um, if you have a, a programming problem and that programming problem tells you that um, the numbers which you're going to be using are um, let's say you're going to be summing 10 integer numbers and you have to output the sum uh, and the integer numbers can be any integer value then you probably should make the sum a long sum why well because if you sum uh, integer dot max value plus integer dot max value minus one that will overflow so if you're working uh, with any if you're calculating a sum for integer values and those integer values can be from minus two, two billion to plus two billion then you probably want the sum to be a long sum okay now another thing we need to discuss about uh, integers are their literals now what we're using over here when we say i less than 130 or when we're saying int number equals 5 this is a so-called literal it's a literal value in the code meaning that the value isn't read from the console it's not uh, taken from another variable like if we have int x equals 5 and then number equals x well x isn't a literal it's a variable but this is a literal representation of uh, a numeric value in the code and this in this case is an integer literal so numeric literals written like this are by default integers so this is an integer it's treated like an integer now you, if you prefix that with 0x or 0x capital that means uh, hexadecimal numeral system so 0xf means 16 that's because f in the hexadecimal numeral system is 16 uh, actually 15 sorry this is 15 because it's a hexadecimal numeral system and the maximum value of any numeral system is one less than the numeral system's name would suggest just like the maximum digit in the decimal numeral system is 9, right? It's not 10. 10 is the numeral system. You get 10 by the digit 1 and the digit 0. Okay, so the maximum hexadecimal is f and you can have multiple. So this is 255 as a value. And how numeral systems work is another subject, which we will cover uh, further on. But it's, uh, it's not something we're going to be discussing today. And anyway, when you see 0x, that means hexadecimal numeral system. Uh, you're often going to see these values for addresses in memory. Addresses in memory are, are typically uh, numbered with this hexadecimal numeral system. Okay, so the, all of these are hexadecimal values. Now, if you see L or L capital, on uh, value that means the value is treated like a long number so instead of int when you say int x and you say that's equal to 5 well that simply uh, converts 5 into an integer and se sets it in into x but if you place an l over here that means this is an, a long number and since we're trying to fit it into an integer now we're getting an error now the reason there is such a suffix for long numbers is in some cases you want a really big number for example let's say 4 billion that's larger than the maximal int value so let's say we have a long number here and we want to set it to 4 billion that's 4 1 2 3 zeros 1 2 3 6 zeros 1 2 3 9 zeros and look what happens so up to this point we have 4 million and now we have 4 billion if we lower it to 2 billion it fits into integer and that's why it compiles however if we raise it up to 4 billion that's larger than the maximum maximal integer value and the compiler is not happy why is it not happy because this is an inter integer literal and there is no integer number which matches this literal integer can't hold such a large number so the compiler says look do you want a long literal here or is this a mistake 
So the compiler checks for us and sees, okay, this is a pretty large number. Maybe he made a mistake. He wanted an integer number, but a, a smaller one. So in order for me to indicate that I'm not making a mistake, I'm adding the suffix L at the end, which indicates that, no, this is not a mistake. Treat that as a long number and save it into the long variable X. Now, using the lowercase L also works, but I wouldn't suggest it. Why? Well, because can you find the difference between 1 and L? Well, you can, but you need to look into it closely. And typically, you wouldn't be looking that closely. So use the capital L, because it doesn't look like uh, the integer number 1. OK. So uh, we have a task over here, which is to write a program which converts meters into kilometers. So we have 1,000 meters, and we should print out one uh, kilometer point eighty five. Okay, so how would we do that? We need to read, of course, that integer number from the console. We need to parse it as an integer. And since integers can't hold floating point data, what we need to do from here on out is to divide that by one thousand and save it into a non-integer number which we can display. Now. It's not so much that this task is complicated, it's that notice how we're doing the division. We're dividing not meters by simply 1000, we're dividing meters by 1000.0. Why are we doing that? Well, because since meters is an integer, if we divide it simply by 1000, an integer divided by an integer gives us a result of an integer. So, dividing 1852 by 1000 would not give us 1.85, it would simply give us 1000. So, uh, sorry, not 1000, it would simply give us 1, the value of 1. So, if we want to receive a result that contains a floating point, well, we need to divide by a floating point number. So, if we divide an integer number by a floating point number, then the compiler decides, okay, so this needs to be a floating point result because it contains a floating point in the arithmetic. So whenever you're dividing something by, uh, whenever you're dividing integers, keep in mind that integer division produces integer results. So any floating point parts will be cut off. Okay, and since we're we started talking about floating point types. The next uh, place we're going to visit is how do we create these floating point types and how we use them. Okay, so we saw the integer data types. And now we need to discuss the real number data types. Now, what do we mean by real numbers? Well, we mean 1.25 minus 0 0.38, uh, 2 to the power of uh, 17, uh, or 2.3 to the power of 17, and so on. That's what we mean by real number types. Numbers which aren't uh, whole numbers, they're numbers which have a decimal part. So these are called floating point types in computing, and these floating point types represent the data we're talking about. So uh, these floating point types don't exactly work like the integer data types, and we'll see why not in a moment, but the, the, the defining characteristic uh, for these floating point types is their precision, meaning how many how many digits they can represent after the decimal point, and how many how much memory they use, how many bytes do they use in memory. So there are two data types for floating point uh, representation of data, and those are float and double. So these float and double have different accuracies depending on their sizes, float is the smaller type and double is the larger type, meaning that double gives you a higher accuracy, hence higher precision because it uses more memory. Now, even, even with double, you will sometimes have abnormalities in calculations and we will see that in a few, see that in a few slides. Uh, and the other thing you uh, need to know about the floating point types is that they don't really have, they do have a maximum value and the minimum value, but their maximum and minimum aren't uh, sequential values like for integer types. Their maximum values can be stuff like this huge number over here and this small number over here. So floating point types are actually exponential types. So they, they represent a small number multiplied 
or a number like 1.37 for example multiplied by a very large exponent so mo or very small exponent so you may have stuff like 2.38 multiplied by 10 to the 20th power or something like that so that's how floating point uh, types are actually represented in computer memory so float goes from about plus or minus 1.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 45th uh, uh, power so that means plus or minus 1.5 divided by 10 with 45 zeros that's the smallest value for float and this is the largest value for float and this floating point data type is seven uh, is uh, represented by 32 bits which is by the way the same as which data type this integer so this is the integer size so the size is the same but the way we represent data in it it's very different like i said in the beginning of the lecture data types just uh, describe how you treat the data at the variable's location not the data itself the data is still ones and zeros and float has the exact same amount of ones and zeros as integer does however it represents floating point values because it uses those bits in a different way so float is approximately seven digits precise so you can expect seven digits precision for average numbers like stuff from zero to one million for example uh, seven digits precision after the the decimal point so uh, actually not not after the decimal point seven digits precision in total so you you can expect precisions of up to seven digits and from there on out the, the precision gets lost so double is twice that and it has a precision of about 15 to 16 digits and again using the digits this way isn't isn't very descriptive uh, of what you actually represent because floating point values aren't uh, stored in memory like a sequence of digits of the number they're stored in memory like an exponent like i mentioned previously they're stored in memory like for example 1.7 multiplied to uh, multiplied by 10 to the 34th power or something like that uh, that's how integer uh, that's how floating point values are stored in memory so their precision is a bit arbitrary and how accurate they are they are is also very arbitrary so when you're doing calculations with floating point and uh, with float and double data types with floating point data types you need to always keep in mind that the calculations may be wrong meaning that they may not be exactly right they they will be correct within a margin of error and that margin of error depends on how big or how small your numbers are okay so the default values for them are respectively zero for float and zero for double and notice how we have added the suffixes f and d to these values so if you type in this literal followed by f that would mean a floating point number whereas if you type in just 0.0, .0 without the d or if you add the d that means a double literal so if these are literals in the code this would be a floating a float literal where, whereas this would be a double literal okay so float and double have different precision if you really want to calculate for precision you use double so if we use a floating point representation of pi we're going to get this cut to about over here so actually let's take this code and see how it works we're copying this and we're placing it inside the uh, live demo over here so what will we see when we run this code is that the floating point value will be cut off to about the middle so here we go the floating point representation of pi gets this value whereas the double representation of pi gets this value so well, what's what's the deal here well the deal is that float has less memory hence it can represent lower accuracies so you notice the seven digits over here so yeah seven digits after the decimal point although i wouldn't count on those always being seven digits after the decimal point uh accurate especially for large numbers so the takeaway here is not so much to remember how many digits uh float or double are accurate to the takeaway here is that if you need to do more accurate calculations 
quick calculations but more accurate you use double if you want to make really quick calculations you use float now float is typically used for stuff like computer graphics because it doesn't really matter if one pixel is one if, if a color is one pixel to the left or to the right uh, it, it's it's acceptable in favor of uh, doubling the frame rate of for example a game so usually computer graphics use floating point numbers to calculate positions in let's say in a 3d game if you have a, a game with 3d graphics those graphics are probably running on floating points because uh, the resolutions of monitors aren't that large for floating point calculation errors to affect them However, if you're doing more important calculations, for example, you're calculating, um, you're, you're doing a physics simulation and you're calculating forces acting on an object, then you probably are going to be using double. Okay, so uh, again, note this suffix which we have on this floating point number. If this isn't an F at the end, if we remove this F, this literal will be treated like a double literal and since double is a larger data type than float it can't directly be entered into a float because there will be precision loss the same way we can't directly uh, write a long number into an integer number because the integer num the long number may be larger than the largest possible integer number same here however it's not about being the, the larger number it's more about the precision of the digits inside the number so if you want to create a literal for a floating point number, you just press, press, uh, place F at the end of that literal. Okay, so continuing on from here, we have a task. We have a task that gets British pounds and has to convert them to US dollars formatted to the third decimal point. So if we have one British pound, that's uh, $1.31. Actually, that's the conversion rate we're using and we want to print it as we want to print it as 1.310 dollars okay so we have here 80 pounds and we need to print them as 104.800 dollars and in this case we'd be using floating point numbers although uh, if you're really going on for accuracy and you're working somewhere where uh, financial operation operations are done you would typically use another approach and let's actually use the other approach but we're, we'll play around with it a bit so we have 80 pounds and we have to convert them into dollars what uh, or we have some amount of pounds and we have to convert them into dollars what do we typically do uh, if we're doing financial financial operations is we don't use the the dollars direct uh, or pounds or dollars does, doesn't really matter we're not using the uh, the, the dollar type directly most financial softwares use cents meaning most financial software uses the the smallest uh, possible uh, denomination of a currency so the the thing that can't be divided into smaller things so a dollar can be uh, div subdivided into cents a uh, pound can be subdivided into pence so that's what you would be using if you want to calculate, uh, for example, exchange rates from pounds to dollars or stuff like that. But since we're playing around with double and float, let's just use that. So we have pounds to dollars to calculate and we're going to get 80 or 39 or another number and we have to convert it into dollars. So we're getting pounds. Let's implement this code. We're getting, and since this is a financial operation, and speed is less important than accuracy let's use double we will be using a double and we'll call that those will be our pounds okay and where will we get, where will we get that double well, let's create a scanner and tell that scanner to read from system.in save it into a variable and use that scanner to read however we don't want to read an integer for our pounds we want to read what we want to read a double next double okay because we're reading from the console and we want we want parsing from the console to take in any um, decimal points which the number may or may not contain okay so we have the pounds and let's get 
the dollars from that dollars equals pounds multiplied by 1.31 so that's our calculation to get dollars from the pounds that's our exchange rate and now we have to print it format it up to the third decimal point so we have to print with three digits after the decimal point so how do we do that we've done that before so well, let's say system.out.print and we're going to print not a line but a formatted string and that formatted string will contain a single floating point number followed by a new line so that it's easier to distinguish from the debug messages okay and we'll be printing the dollars over here and what did we say we want the dollars to be formatted up to the third decimal point so we're plot printing a floating point number and we want how many decimal points we want three so we say decimal points three okay let's see what happens if our program seems to be working correctly now starting this I will input 80 and I'll see 104.800 that seems correct now it's best for me to calculate the other possible um, uh, inputs and see if my calculations are correct but since this is a lecture we won't be playing around with that too much so the solution which we're offered here in the slides is pretty much the same which we already did we read the double number from the console multiply it by 1.31 and print it as a result now again if you're doing actual financial operations and actual uh, software which will be working with clients this isn't exactly a good idea what you would be doing in reality would be you would be reading the pounds as let's say a double from the console but you would be multiplying them by 100 and be getting an integer pence was that the multiple of penny anyway let's say let's say that it is even if we're wrong okay now yeah, th this would actually not be an input of double on the console. This would be an input of integer, and I'm, I wouldn't be multiplying it by 100. I would just be reading the pence from the console, the number of pennies read from the console. I think you can, we can use pennies in multiple uh, like this, or maybe we can't, but it doesn't really matter. So I've uh, studied it like pence before, or, or at least I think I've studied it, studied it like that before. So we're getting an integer from the console, and that would be the, the, the pence we are getting for our pound. So we're, we wouldn't be reading a double number from the console, we would be reading an integer. And then those pence would be converted into uh, cents by multiplying these pence by not 1.31 by, but by 131. And only then would we be probably dividing these cents by 100.0 because this would uh, this would be an integer too and then we'd be dividing by 100.0 so we can get the double number to display now this would be if you're actually doing some financial calculations or that that's one option another option is to use the big decimal class which we will see in a few slides so we'll get to that in a moment okay so another thing you need to keep in mind about floating point numbers is that they can be represented by literals such as these so this literal is actually pretty close to how floating point numbers are represented in memory and it means the number over here is 1 multiplied by 10 to the power of plus 34 so 1e 1e e, e plus 34 is actually equal to 1 multiplied by 10 with 34 zeros so uh, let's use something easier to write out if you see 1e e plus 3 that's 1000 why well because that's 1 multiplied by 10 with 3 zero multiplied by 10 to the power of 3 which is 10 which is 1000 so uh, 10 multiplied by 10 is 100 and multiplied by 10 again is 1000 10 to the third power so this is what this notation means and if you see this notation 20 it's the same notation but it's a different example 20 e minus 3 that's the same as saying 20 multiplied by 10 to the minus third power now if you have a negative power what does that mean well a negative power simply means that you have to divide instead of multiply so it's what you get 
is 20 divided by 1000 because 10 to the power of 3 is 1000 and the negative uh, power just means division instead of multiplication so that's what is that that's 0 0.02 as a value now these values exist and they can be parsed from the console so if you create a very large number and print it on the console Java's default behavior would be to print it like such a value and that's why we're showing you this notation so you don't uh, get confused when you get a very small or very, very large value, value represented like this and you can use it as a literal in your code and you can even uh, read it from the console so uh, scanner dot next double can read stuff like uh, 20e minus 3 and that would give you uh, 0 0.02 actually let's try that let's see if it if it works so let's say we just have to get a number from the console and print it back on the console so print line um, number and this number will be a double number which we get from the scanner dot give me the next double and if I start this I should be able to enter 20e minus 3 or let's say 30e minus let's say 42e minus 3 42e minus 3 and that should give us what that should give us 0 0.42 or something like that let's see 0 0.042 sorry so 42e minus 3 means 42 divided by 1000 which gives us what well it gives us 0 0.042 Okay, so the reason we're showing you these uh, representations of floating point numbers is both for convenience because sometimes you want to represent a very large number as a literal and you can use literals like this or sometimes you will have input like these literals and you can read it directly from the console. You don't need to do anything spe uh, special to uh, handle numbers such as these entered on the console. Now, something we already mentioned in a few slides back when we were uh, talking about um, converting integers to floating point values is that floating point division isn't the same as integer division. If you divide integers by integers, you get integers and you lose the floating points. But if you divide an integer by a floating point number, you get a floating point number. So 10 divided by 4 and 4 as a floating point number will give you 2.5 because 2.5 multiplied by 4 will give you 10. So floating point division calculates, I'd say accurately, but it's not always completely accurately, but its concept is to calculate accurately, but due to being limited by uh, a fixed amount of memory, it can't always represent every number um, that's representable as a floating point, but it attempts to calculate without losing precision so whenever you need to divide something into equal parts you can get uh, you, you can do that with floating point division okay now there are other things which don't match floating point uh, division with integral division integer division and those are the following if you have a number, if you have an integer number, let's say we have an integer number number, and we have an integer number divider. Now, if this number is say 42, but the divider is zero, and we try to print the number divided by the divider, what we'll get on the console is an exception. Java will crash and we'll get uh, an arithmetic divide by zero exception. So you can't divide integers if one of the if the divider is zero so you can't divide by zero for integers however if these are floating point numbers if this is double and this is double or at least if one of those is double since a, an arithmetic operation involving a double will always result in a double so if you divide a double by zero, you will get a special value called infinity. And here we got exactly that. A special meaning if you divide by a positive value by zero, you will receive infinity. And if you divide a negative value by zero, you will receive minus infinity. 
And if you divide zero by zero, you will call you will get another special value called not a number, N A N. That's for floating point division only. And if you ever have a number with one of these values, whatever you do with it, it will remain its own value. The only exception being that if you divide infinity by infinity, you, you will get not a number. But if you multiply not a number by anything, it will remain not a number. And if you multiply infinity by anything, it will remain not a number. The only case in which one of these special values changes is when you um, divide infin an infinity by another infinity and then you get not a number. So those are special values for floating point numbers and you shouldn't be uh, very surprised by them. They are, they are um, a standard concept in the way computers handle floating point numbers. And the reason all of this is possible is that uh, the, is that reading uh, is that using floating point numbers and the, the, were people who are actually scientists. So when floating point numbers were created, they were created for physics simula simulation, for example, calculating the position of a planet. In those cases, you don't need centimeter accuracy when you're calculating where a planet is in the solar system. You just need to calculate approximately where that planet is located and how fast it's moving and so on. And in calculations like that, physics calculations, infinities and not numbers and exponential notation are standard practice. Hence, floating point numbers are optimized for those types of uh, calculations. So whenever you're, you're going for fast calculations which need to be semi-accurate, you're using floating point numbers. Okay, and you need to just keep in mind these special cases. Okay, now there are things which floating point numbers uh, do a bit unusually. So again, these are numbers which are... Uh, they are made for not complete accuracy. So let's have an example over here with something interesting. Let's say we have um, a double number A and a double number B. Those are the high precision floating point numbers, not the floats. So A will be 0 0.1 and B will be 0 0.2. And we can even read them from the console if you like. Okay, so let's calculate their sum. And say that sum is a plus b. Now, if we now write if sum equals 0 0.3 and print on the console the result of this sum and say um, yes, for example, okay, so yes meaning that this um, comparison was correct. And otherwise, if we add an else which says yes but actually no what would you guess would happen in this case if we start this code let's see we'll start this code and we'll see what get printed what gets printed on the console surprise we got yes but actually no but how did we get that 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 should be 0 0.3 meaning that since it's 0 0.3 we should get into this conditional statement and print a yes. Well, yes, but actually no, because in normal math, yes, in, in human math, yes, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is 0 0.3. However, if we place a breakpoint over here, since floating point numbers represent exponential sums, and since they are, um, they are limited in accuracy, meaning that they have a fixed number of bytes they can use to represent data, what happens is not all numbers have a correct representation in that uh, way we're saving the data type into memory. So for this sum uh, of 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, what we get is not 0 0.3, but 0 0.3 and a lot of zeros followed by the digit 4. Why? Well, because floating point math isn't completely accurate. There are subtle subtle errors here and there which typically average out if you're doing large calculations but that means that you can never uh, compare two floating point values directly two floating point values that have been uh, enter that have been a product uh, 
th that are a product of a calculation. I would have said that uh, that have been entered from the console, but you actually can't compare floating point values if they have been just entered from somewhere. You just can't rely on a calculation of floating point numbers to give you an exact result. So what's usually done in this case, if you want to check against some floating point value, what you user usually do is use math.apps and you subtract um, from sum this 0 0.3 value. So um, you subtract from what, your, uh, what you have or actually you, you would subtract from the absolute value of what you have, the value with which you're comparing, and then see if that's larger than zero, or and not zero, but larger than, for example, 0 0.1, or 0 0.01, or 0 0.0001. This way, what you're doing is you're calculating, and yeah, actually, uh, the initial uh, way I wrote it was correct, Let's say you're calcul you're one what you want is to check if the distance from sum to 0 0.3 is less than 0 0.001, for example. What I'm doing here is I'm not comparing directly sum with 0 0.3, but I'm reducing sum by 0 0.3, and if sum is very close to 0 0.3, then the absolute value of this difference should be very small. You know, it, it's like comparing the two, but I'm not comparing them exactly, I'm comparing them within a range of this value. So if you have a programming task which expects you to do something with floating point numbers, it will usually have a so-called epsilon defined, which is the smallest number uh, from which on you, you consider two numbers equal. So if they have a difference of that epsilon which is provided in the task description, then if, if the difference of the two numbers is less than that epsilon, then they are considered equal. So in uh, programming, when you're doing such calculations and searching for equality, usually that equality is checked within some uh, epsilon, uh, some range of possible equalities. Okay, so that's one of the weirdness of floating point numbers. You just have to keep that in mind. Now, most tasks in our lessons will not involve precise calculations with floating point numbers, so you don't need to worry about this too much. But if you're in some larger project, if you're comparing, comparing floating point values, you will probably be comparing them like this. You compare the value you've calculated with the value you want to check against by subtracting one from the other, doesn't really matter in what order, taking the absolute value of that, and then checking if that uh, absolute value is less than, or actually this should have been less than, not larger than, is less than some epsilon, which basically means that the distance from the between these two numbers on the numerical axis is less than this distance over here, and that means that you consider them equal. So in floating point math, nothing is ever exactly equal, it's approximately equal. And here's another example of that with other numbers. There are a lot of numbers which aren't exactly representable in floating point. Okay, so in case you actually need very accurate calculations, but you don't need them to be fast, you can use the big decimal class. Big decimal is a special data type which provides arithmetic operations which are absolutely precise. So this is absolute precision floating point calculations. Uh, how, how high is that precision? Well, it depends on the amount of memory you have on your computer. So this uh, big decimal type isn't a fixed size type like int or float or double. It's a variable size type which can take up more memory as it needs to grow. So when you're doing financial calculations, either you're using cents, meaning the least, uh, the, the smallest denomination of a currency, or you're using big decimal to represent that currency, and you're doing the operation slower. So big decimal works pretty much like a normal variable, but you don't initialize it directly by giving it a value. You just need to say big decimal, like you would int, the name of your variable and then the keyword new followed by big decimal and then the value of that big decimal. Or you could do uh, big, big decimal dot value of 
and provide an integer from which this needs to be parsed. Or if you've got a string, you just say new big decimal, decimal, and you provide the string over here, for example, 42, because this could be a very large string which isn't representable in integer or long or anything, uh, or 42.3, that would also work. So big decimal and provided the string 42.3, and that will parse it into a big decimal. Or if you provided a large string which can't fit into any data type, it will still fit it, as long as you have enough memory to, to fit that. Okay, and the operations you do on it are directly on the variable itself. So you don't say number plus, you'd say number dot add. And you provide the parameter, which is the other big decimal you want to add in. Okay, actually we have a task which involves involves using big decimal. We have n real numbers and we need to sum them in. And they could be a lot of these numbers. So n is a normal integer, but the numbers themselves, so here 2 says we have two numbers, and this is the first number and this is the second number, and we need to add them together. How do we do that? Well, let's see what we can do. So. We need to use the scanner to read the next integer from the console, and this would be our number of values. And I'm using n here instead of number of values because that is the business logic of our task. So in the task, it's described as n, which is just n, which equals the numbers which need to be read. Okay, so then I'll use n for my variable name. I can use the variable names described in the task. Because whenever someone then reads the task, they will know exactly what this variable means. And I can also uh, call it number of numbers or something. But n seems sufficient for now. Okay, so now I need to read this many numbers from the console. So I need to do a for loop which starts from 0 and continues until it reaches n. And does what? Well, I need to sum into a big decimal. So I'd be needing a big decimal number over here, which is our sum. And this I will initialize with a new big decimal. Now it wants a parameter with, uh, the, with the initial value, and I'll say that the initial value is just 0. OK, so I'll initialize my sum with big decimal 0. And then I can say, uh, read the next big decimal. Well, how will I read that next big decimal? Well, I'll have it on a separate line. And since I have each of them on a separate line, let's read the string from the console. So let's say line equals scanner dot give me the next line. Or actually, I'd say the next number. Give me the next number from the uh, the next thing from the input. Since reading the next integer will we'll read up to here. And if I say next line, that will just give me an empty line because it's at the end of this symbol. And I would need to somehow move my cursor to the next line. So if I want to read with next line after I've done next int, I should probably do a next line over here. So I can eat up this empty line at the end. So whenever you read with next int, it only reads up until the end of the thing you have to be parsed. So if it's an integer, it will read to the end of the integer, but it will not read the new line symbol over here. So it will stay over at this position. And then, and then if you say next line, well, next line ends over here. So that would be an empty string. So instead of playing around with the lines, what I do is I just say scanner.next. That will give me the next string. So if I read the next int, that will read up to here. But next string will search for the next start of a string that isn't a white space. So this is a white space over here, so it will ignore it, and it will start from here. So this will be the next string that it reads. OK, so this reads me the next string, and I need to convert it into something I can sum into my sum. So what can I sum into my sum? Well, I can say sum.add, and I need to provide the big decimal here. OK, how do I? provide a big decimal here, well I need to create the big decimal from this line. How do I create a big decimal from this line? I simply say big decimal and here I can, I think I can provide the string. Let's see, uh, can I provide a string value? What I did was 
I came with the cursor over here and I pressed Control P. And I saw each of these lines is a different option of initialization for big decimal. And if I look around hard enough, I can see that I can provide a string value. So I can provide my line over here. So this will parse my big decimal into a, uh, uh, my line into a big decimal and it will calculate the sum of this big decimal and this line. Now, notice that doing the sum like this is the same as saying sum plus new big decimal line if plus were available. Now, plus isn't available for big decimal like this for int, but it's the same concept. Now, how do I... Uh, how do I get the actual value from here on out? Well, I need to assign it back into sum because if I, I were using the plus sign, I would be saying sum equals sum plus uh, line if line was a number. I wouldn't be just saying sum plus line. I would be saying sum equals sum plus line. Same situation here. Sum gets replaced by sum. Compute the sum of this with this value. Okay, so this calculates the sum. And now I can use that uh, value to print it to the console. So I can say system.out.print line and print this sum. And if I start this, I will see that it prints the sum of these big integers which are entered here. Let's use uh, big decimals, I meant, which are entered here. Let's check that. Two. Two numbers, the numbers are this large thing and the number number five, and the output seems correct. So we work uh, our code works for very large values. Let's check with these also. Pasting these in, this seems that it matches the value which we have here as an example. <clears throat> and again, we should test this program out with different inputs, but we won't be wasting time in the lesson here. We will uh, let you guys uh, figure that out on your own at home, test it out, play around with uh, this class. Uh, there's also a big integer class. It's meant for representing big integer, uh, for integer numbers which are larger than long. So if you need to store very large integer numbers, you can use big integer for that. Whereas big decimal, you use if you need to store very large floating point numbers. Okay, so this would calculate the exact sum of a few real numbers over here. Okay, and we have a solution for that, which more or less reflects what I wrote. Okay, so another thing which we need to cover is how we can convert between types. So what do I mean by that? You noticed that if I create an integer and I say that this integer should become equal to uh, a long number, for example, 5L, I get an error. Why do I get an error? Because long can represent larger values than int. And if I try to save a long inside an int, well, I'd lose accuracy. So I'd lose the actual value if that value is larger than the largest uh, integer value int can represent. Okay, so I can't do this. However, I can use do the reverse. I can create a long number and assign it with an integer. Why? Well, because the integer numbers are, all of the integer numbers can be fit into long because long is a larger type. Same goes for double and float, by the way. So if I create a double number uh, double and assign that to 0.4f, and you, you remember that f means floating point, this works. It's okay because floating point is a smaller type than double and it can fit into double. Okay, but in, if you want to do the reverse, if you want to say integer x equals n, like in this case we have a long number n, and you, we want to save that n into x, and we know that we can. Like you see that here we have 5. We know that this is a small number. For some reason we've saved it into a long, for example, let's say uh, we've got some large calculations, uh, and these calculations could have overflown in, but then we've got a lot of subtractions and then that those have caused the number to reduce. And we know they can fit into integer, but, our, but Java doesn't allow us to do that. It gives us a compiler error. Why does it give us a compile error? Because Java doesn't know what this value could be. We could have changed that somewhere in our code to something 
which it can determine compile time, and hence it can't allow us to uh, assign the value directly. <clears throat> so what do we do then? Well, we do the following thing. We cast this value into the type we want. So we say convert this thing into an integer. Now by doing this we sort of uh, give our signature that uh, we're responsible for losing accuracy. If we don't, Java says, look, you're going to lose accuracy here. Are you sure you want to do this? I won't allow you to do this unless you tell me you're sure. And the way we tell Java we are sure is by just saying that this needs to be casted into an integer. And if there's any loss of accuracy, that's our responsibility because we've explicitly requested the conversion into an integer. Now, this over here, the, the assignment of an integer to a long, is called an implicit conversion because it happens implicitly. We don't have to explicitly mention that we want this conversion to happen because the long data type can contain the can contain the int data type. Data type. However, since the int data type can't contain the long data type, or at least can't contain any long value, it can contain some of them but not all of them. Uh, we need to explicitly say that look, we know that we're we could lose accuracy here, but it's fine, that's what we want to do. So this is called typecasting, converting one type into another by uh, by losing data or sometimes not losing data. So implicit conversions are lossless. For example, if you uh, assign a float to a double, that's lossless, or an int to a long, that's lossless. However, if you have a double and you want to assign that into an integer or, or a long and want to assign that into an integer, well that's explicit conversion. You need to explicitly say yes, I want to use, uh, I want to lose the accuracy of this data type and convert it into another data type. Okay, now in what situations would you be uh, doing that? Well here we have a problem where we, we're converting centuries to minutes, but I'll give you another example. Let's say we have minutes and we need to convert them into hours. Let's say uh, we have the task of someone needs to uh, uh, do a lecture and uh, we're, we know yeah, let, okay, let's, let's formulate it like this. Um, someone needs to, uh, to conduct a lecture, to conduct a lesson. That lesson uh, is going to be some amount of minutes long and uh, once that um, person starts doing the lecture, they're going to spend some amount of minutes um, conducting the lecture. And then, uh, let's say we want to, um, after they've conducted the lecture and after the students have seen the lecture, we want to provide them with a video which uh, contains the lecture. So that video will have some length in minutes. But students don't really care about lengths and minutes since the lecture is long. They want to know whether that lecture is one hour, two hours, or three hours, or something like that. So let's say our lecture can be anywhere between one and four hours. And we need to get the minutes that that lecture, uh, that, that lesson uh, took, the minutes that that lesson took, and present those minutes as hours. Okay? So uh, what we need to do is convert the minutes into hours and then lose part of the accuracy. So what we need to do is have an integer number of minutes. Okay, so we're having minutes. Let's say we read them, read them from the console. Okay, and now we need to calculate how many hours these are and convert them into an integer number. So we want, we want an integer number of hours which will be displayed to our students. So they can say, okay, so this lecture is three hours or about three hours, not exactly three hours, but about three hours. So that's the amount of time I'm going to need to, to watch it. Okay, so what am I, what will I need to do here? Well, the hours we will first initialize as a double. Okay, so how, how do these hours look as minutes? Well, they look as the minutes divided by 60.0. Why dot zero? Because dot zero will convert this into a double number and hence this division will be a double division, floating point division, which will keep its accuracy. And then 
I will convert it into the approximate hours the approximate number of hours. How will I do that? Well, I'll first round the number, the hours number. So if I get uh, 3.2 hours, that would give me three, hour, three hours. Whereas if I get 3.9 hours, that should give me four hours. Okay, but math.round, we know that this gives us a round number because that's the function of math.round, it rounds a number. Okay, but we still can't assign it to approx hours. Why can't we assign it? Well, because math.rounds returns a double number. Why does it return a double number? Because it accepts a double number and it's easier to return a double from this since it's already a double. We're just returning another double as a result because we don't know how this is going to be used. So that's what math.round does. It returns a double number. But we're sure that this is an integer number so we can cast it to an integer. We can sign uh, our responsibility here. We can say, look, I know that I may lose accuracy but I've done my math and I know that this value will be okay when converted into an int for my purposes. And then I can print those hours back on the console. And now if I start this program, I will see that if I enter, for example, uh, 125 minutes, 125 minutes, those should be two hours. So if I press enter, I got two hours. So you use explicit typecasting when you know that something can be stored as the smaller type, smaller like in this case int is smaller as uh, uh, int is less precise than double and in that uh, sense it is smaller than double. Uh, so when you know that you can store it without negative side effects for your program and that would depend on what your program is and what it aims to do. Okay, so Here's another example of converting centuries into minutes and there are calculations involved here as well and you can test these out for yourself too. Now the last thing we need to do before we go into the break is discuss quickly the boolean data type which we have. Now we already use the boolean data type but we use it indirectly. What do I mean by indirectly? Well whenever we say for example, let's have two numbers, the number a, which is equal to 5, and the number b, which is equal to 10. Whenever we say if a is less than b, what actually happens is a less than b is calculated and it provides a result. What is the type of this result? Well, if you extract a variable from this result, you will get a Boolean variable, and that Boolean variable contains the result of whether a is less than b. So this is a less than b. B, and the type of that boolean variable is boolean so this is a result that can either be true or false and the data type for a result that can either be true or false is boolean so this can contain any sort of comparison anything you do with the comparison operators this will be able to contain its result now the boolean data type also can be printed directly onto the console and it prints out true or false depending on its value Okay, so that's pretty much it for the Boolean data type. That's how it looks like. Uh, the um, one important thing about it is that if you have a Boolean variable, even though it can be stored in exactly one bit, one bit, either a one or a zero, it is actually stored in an entire byte. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros and one after them. So these are 8 bits and this would mean true, whereas false would look like this, 4 zeros and another 4 zeros. A single byte with only zeros is false. Now why is that? Well the reason for that, the reason for using an entire byte instead of a single bit is that the smallest addressable part of the computer's RAM memory is a byte and variables can only represent and at least a single byte. Variables actually represent addresses in memory and the smallest addressable thing in memory is a byte, hence the smallest thing you can use is a byte. So a boolean variable is actually an entire byte even though it needs a single bit. And there are ways to, um, for example, have eight 
boolean variables in a single byte but that's done through some uh, hacks with uh, bitwise operations which aren't really uh, the subject of this lesson but we will see them in other places so keep that in mind each boolean isn't a single bit it's a, it is a single byte so if you have 10 booleans that's a that's 80 bits not eight uh, if you have 10 booleans that's a uh, hundred how does it look like? Yeah, 80 bits instead of 10 bits. So 10 booleans, it, they could be represented in 10 bits, but they aren't because computer memory doesn't work that way. Okay, so we have a task over here. We have special numbers, and a number is special when the sum of its digits is 5, 7, or 11. And now our task is what? Well, we need to iterate all the numbers from 1 to n and print whether a number is special or it isn't. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to separate a number into its digits and uh, calculate whether uh, that sum is either 5 or 7 or 11 and then uh, print that out for the number. And notice how we have true or, false, true or false printed over here. Now, how would we do that? Well, we do a for loop. So what is our input? Our input is to which number we need to go. So let's say we're reading a number n in n equals scanner dot give me the next integer and then we're starting for loop from 0 to that n and how do we find the sum of the numbers of uh, uh, the sum of the digits of this number well we've actually done that in a previous lesson we've separated the number into its digits how were we uh, how are we supposed to do that oh and by the way we're not starting from 0 we're starting from 1 uh, how are we, and we're going up to n inclusive, not to n exclusive. And how are we doing that? Well, we're just, we need to get the number, and the number is i. And actually, I'll rename this to number, because it will be easier to read that way. And I'll do what? Well, I'll start, start a while loop, and I'll say, okay, so while that number is larger than zero, I will say uh, int digit equals that number, give me the remainder of that number divided by 10 which gives me the last digit of the number and then I'll say the number just becomes uh, the number becomes itself divided by 10 number becomes itself divided by 10 and now in order for me not to play around with the control variable of this loop because that would move around this index which I have I would change it back to i to this integer which I'm floating around and now then I'll just say int number is equal to i so I'm creating a number that I initialize with the current number I'm looking at and then I play around with this number to get each of its digits okay and my task is to determine whether the sum of it of the digits of this number is uh, 5 7 or 11 okay so these digits I'm getting here I need to add into a sum okay so this sum begins from zero and each time i get a digit i add that digit into the sum so for each number i will run this for loop and then i'll have the sum of its digits over here and now what can i do well i can detect whether this sum is divisor is uh five or seven or eleven how do i detect that well i just say um I can do I can write if statements and then create boolean variables for them but I can also create boolean variables directly so is the is uh, 5 will be equal to if the sum is equal to 5 and is 7 will be equal to is the sum equal to 7 and is 11 will be equal to is the sum equal to 11 so uh, this should be sum is 5 and sum is 7 and sum is 11 and what I print is if is 5 or it is 7 or it is 11 in each of these cases I do what well I just say system.out.print true but if I'm going to be printing true or false why not just use the value of this boolean which I get over here because this is a boolean value this is uh, the boolean value which says is special is it a special number 
Well, it's a special number if its sum is either 5 or 7 or 11. This is what I'm saying over here, and then I can directly print it on the console. System.out.println is special. So that's how I use Boolean variables. I just uh, combine them with OR or AND expressions, and I can use them, and I can initialize them by doing comparison operators, placing comparison operators between values uh, in my program. Okay, so that's one way to solve this task. And you can test around if this thing works correctly. We may have made a mistake, but I'll leave solving this task up to you. And here is a solution which solves our problem the way of uh, the way, pretty much similar to what I showed you just now. Uh, if you need help, you can look at this solution. But test it around and play around with it, uh, and see what see what you can get as a result. Now the character data type is something that represents, as you might guess, characters in, uh, in computing. So, how does it do that? All of the data we've seen up until this point has been of integers. So we've seen integers, uh, uh, not exactly integers, but numbers. So we've seen numbers in, uh, in integer form, we've seen numbers in floating point form, we've seen um, We've seen calculations with them, we've seen comparisons with them, but we haven't really seen symbols on the console. So the character data type in Java and in other languages too uh, is declared by the char keyword or char keyword or however you would like to read that. Let's read that as char because it seems more intuitive. So this char keyword creates a character data type. This is the character data type. And that character data type is actually also a number. So the way uh, text works in computers, just like I told you earlier, um, when you have values in computers, there are always ones and zeros. There's no such thing as characters in computers, but there's also no such thing as integers or floating point numbers. So what actually happens is we treat the ones and zeros in a certain part of memory in a certain way. So the way we treat character data types is the following way. A character is just a numeric representation, which is then pulled from a table of character descriptions, so of character images. So whenever you render a character on the console, for example, you print someone's name, the characters in that name are actually just numbers which are drawn by using the images from some table which says at, for index, uh, for symbol 65, you should print the capital letter A in English. And for symbol um, 98, you should print the lowercase letter B in English. So, characters are just numbers. Each character represents a, it, it represents a symbol through an integer code. So, there's a table of symbols, and that table of symbols has symbols matched by integers uh, by integer codes and whenever you have a character that's actually that integer code and whenever you display that character it just renders as that integer code so the default value for a character is slash zero slash zero, zero you might notice that these are two symbols at least as a literal but actually this is one symbol because the slash is a special symbol that uh, encodes the next symbol after it will talk about this in a moment. Okay, and it also takes 16 bits of memory, meaning that it is equal to the short data type in size. And the values it represents are from this thing to this thing, which is just a special way of describing the Unicode code table. So the character data type represents Unicode characters, and these Unicode characters basically allow you to represent any alphabet from any nation around the world. So anything, any symbol you can think of can be represented through Unicode. Okay, so uh, what does this mean over here? Well, this is just a hexadecimal representation of the integer code of a Unicode symbol. So this is Unicode symbol 0, which equals this 0 default value. And this is Unicode symbol 65,535 because that's the largest number you can fit into a 16-bit integer. Okay, so how do characters look on uh, in Java? Well, let's 
create some characters and see how they behave. So if I create a character data type, I can assign it, let's say this is the letter okay, variable, I can assign it with this special literal. The character literal is a single quoted single symbol value. So I can write, for example, a symbol here like star, or I can uh, enter the capital letter A. And if I print this thing on the console, system built out, dot print line, if I print this letter on the console, the console will contain the letter A. Let's see that. Okay, so our console now contains the letter A. Okay, what can we do else with this uh, symbol? Well, I can force it into an integer. So, instead of printing it as a letter, I can say, okay, I don't want this letter as a letter, I want this letter as an integer. You remember this, we, talk, we talked about this uh, a few minutes ago, and it's called typecasting. So, we're typecasting this letter into an integer, meaning that this letter will now be treated as an integer number. If, and if I start this, you will see that the console will contain A on the first line and 65 on the second line. Why does it contain 65? Why is A represented as 65 and not as something else? Well, if you go Google the ASCII character table, or the Unicode character table for that matter, because ASCII is just a subset of the Unicode character table, you will see that symbol 65 is capital A, and symbol 66 is capital B, and so on. So characters are just integers which, when rendered actually shorts, but you get the idea, they're integer numbers, integer code points, which when rendered on the console are displayed with a special symbol depending on what symbol represents them in the Unicode table. However, they, they act the same as any normal integer. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you want to print all the letters, all the capital English letters, guess what you can do? Well, since this is just a number, you can start a for loop starting not from, not from integer i equals zero, but from character i equals, and not zero, but the first letter in the English alphabet, capital A. And then continue on until the last uh, character in the English alphabet, capital Z, but we need to continue inclusively because A and Z are just numbers. We write them as symbols, but whenever I write A like this, the computer actually understands 65. And whenever I write Z like this, it understands 65 plus the difference between A and, A and Z, the number of English letters. Okay, so let's see what this does. System dot out dot print. Let's print them on the same line. Dot print I. Because I is a character now, it will be printed as a character. And now if I start this code, I will see the alphabet printed on my console. And here's the alphabet. That's because characters are just numbers, which are treated as characters when they're printed on the console, but are treated as numbers otherwise. Okay, what else can I do with characters? Well, there are special functions which I can call on characters, which uh, make them behave in different ways. For example, I can say character dot to lowercase and supply this character i over here. So this converts this character i into the lower class uh, lowercase i. So if I start this code like right now, what I'd see is the lowercase letters. Of course, I could have done that by just using a and z lowercase letters over here, but I wanted to demonstrate the two lowercase function. Now, if you call two lowercase over something that isn't a character, for example, the symbol 5, nothing will happen, you just receive the same character. Okay, and there are other things you can do. For example, you can say, uh, if I, if character dot is digit I, then do something. This will check if this character is one of the digits either 0 with the, like a character, the character 0, or if it's the character 1, or if it's the character 2, or the character 3, or the character 4, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a way to check if a character, and there's also is alphabetic, which checks if a character is uh, an alphabetic symbol, which checks for any alphabet, meaning that this will check for, for example, Cyrillic, uh, whether a character is uh, alphabetic. Okay, so this works for everything, and this is basically the character type. It's 
pretty it's a pretty simple simple numerical type but that numerical type can be treated both as a character and as a number you can do arithmet arithmetic on it you can increase it you can calculate sums for it and so on okay so let's um solve a task now there is a simple task over here where we have three lines of characters and we need to print them and reverse this is a pretty simple task we just need to read a separate line okay well it's not completely simple okay let's do it let's do it so we need the character a and the character b and the character c the three characters were, were be going we're going to be reading okay and we need to print them in reverse order on the same line with the space between them so what i need to do is system dot out dot print and i need to print what i need to print the first character then the second character then the third character okay well how do i do that well one easy way to do it i could use a formatted string but one easier way to do it is just say print the character c and then print a space like this and then print the character B and then print a space after that and then print the character A and then print a space after that that's the simplest way to do it now I have compilation errors here but I have them because I haven't initialized character A or character B or character C okay so let's read character A from the scanner what do I what can I get here I can do I can't do next char and I can do simply next which would read a string or I can do next line because they've told me that these are each on separate lines okay so I do next line but that returns a string not a character well as we'll see in a few moments a string is just a sequence of characters and I can tell a string please give me the character at position 0 or at position 1 or at position 2 so the character at position 0 is the first character in a string so I read an entire line that entire line is a string which contains only one symbol and I just say give me the zero position of that uh, string string start at position zero okay and I can do the same thing for character B and character C I read a single line and then I take the first character from that line and I can do the printing over here and if we start this code we will see that these um, characters are printed in reverse order but that's not really that much of an interesting task so let's do another task and that task will um, have applications in other places too so what is the other task I, I want us to solve the task is the following I'll have a character entered from the console as a single line that character will either be uh, a letter or it won't be a letter my task is to output uh, which letter in the alphabet that character is it could be a lowercase or uppercase letter I don't know which it could be a lowercase or, or uppercase letter or it could be something different than a letter and if it's different than a letter I just I should just print uh, not a letter okay so let's handle that case I read the character already and let's check if it's a letter how do I check that well I use the character dot is alphabetic method and then I supply that character to that uh, is alphabetic method so if that character is alphabetic I'd be doing something I'd be doing the calculation of which uh, symbol in the alphabet it is okay otherwise I'd be doing what well I'd be printing system dot out dot print line not a letter okay so I have part of the task solved already that's great but how do I get the number of this letter in the alphabet let's say that um, if I want the character if they provide me with the character let's name this letter let's name this just uh, letter oops yeah let's name this letter uh, and this rename the string it sometimes renames the strings uh, when you have uh, when you try to rename a letter it depends on what you pick when it asks you whether you want to remain or replace only code occurrences or not anyway so we read a, read a letter from the console and I'm asking is this alphabetic and if it is alphabetic I want to uh, print which uh, which is its number in the alphabet and let's say that 
um, for simplicity, the character A will be the value 0 and the character B will be the value of 1 and so on. Programmers count from 0. We will learn why when we get to the lesson about arrays. But let's say for now the programmer just counted 0 and that's why the, the letter A from the English alphabet we will treat as the 0 number letter. So the letter at position 0. Okay, so whether they uh, enter B capital or B lowercase or C capital or C lowercase or A capital or A lowercase, I would still want to find out which letter this is in the alphabet, starting from 0, where, where A is 0. How do I do that? Well, I already know that the letter is alphabetic. Okay, so how do I find which is its position in the alphabet according to these rules? Well, since it could both be a capital case or a lower case, one thing I can do is just convert it into one of the cases. So I don't need to worry uh, for the two different situations. So I'd say uh, letter is now changed to character dot to lowercase, converted to a lowercase representation, this letter. If it already was lowercase, fine, nothing will happen. And if it wasn't lowercase, it will be changed to lowercase. So I'm only dealing with this case from here on out. Okay, so what do I do here? Well, what I know is that each character has a number, right? And if I check the, the number for A, it will be 97. In the uh, Unicode uh, table, A is the symbol 97. And B is the symbol 98. And C is the symbol 99. You see a pattern here? So A is the symbol 97. And B is the symbol 19, so they're, they're sequential. And they're just numbers. Well, if I need to print 0 for A, then I just need to subtract A from A, because 97 minus 97 equals 0. And that gives me that 0 I need for A, because 97 is the code for A. And if I subtract 98 minus 97, that would give me 1. So if I subtract B, minus a, so if I, if I do b minus a, which is 98 min minus 97, that would give me 1. And 1 is the value for, uh, for b, like I want in this task. And same thing goes for c. If I subtract the code for c, if I subtract from it the code for a, I get 2, right? So that gives us the number 2 for position 2 in the alphabet. So that's all I need to do. I need to say uh, int position equals subtract from the current letter what? Well, the first letter in the alphabet. Uh, subtract, not assign. So the position is the, the letter's position currently minus the first letter in the alphabet. And I'm lo using lowercase a because I've converted this letter to lowercase. Okay, so let's print this out on the console now. System.out.println position. Let's print this position, position and see what we get. Let's see if my code is correct, if I correctly print um, positions in the alphabet. Okay, so printing for A. A is position 0. Great, that's what I wanted. Okay, let's do that for lowercase c. Lowercase c is second position in my alphabet. Is this what I wanted? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted. Okay, so this is a way of doing arithmetic with characters. Now, homework assignment. It's not really a homework assignment, but something I suggest you try to implement. Two characters will be entered on the console. Uh, these characters will be entered one after another, directly one after another. So you will get... You know what? It's, it's not... Um, two characters, you will get a number, you will get a number n, so you will get uh, an integer number uh, n, let's say 3, and then you will get three characters entered on the console, like, for example, like so. And your task is to calculate the sum of all the digits in those, ca in those letters. So this would be 8. How would we do that? Well, we'd read the number 3, then we'd read a string with next line. So we do just next line. Then we start a for loop starting from i equals 0 because the string starts at 0 until i reaches less than 3. And then we'll take charret i. 
and that's our letter. Okay, and now for the letter, what do you need to do? Well, you need to check uh, for the symbol. It's actually better to call it a symbol. And then for the symbol, you check, is it a digit? And if it is a digit, you need to convert it into a number because the digit 3 isn't the number 3. It's uh, some value in the ASCII table. But you can convert it into a number the same way we converted the position in the alphabet to a number because the the digits in the ASCII code table are ordered in the same way. So you won't be subtracting A, you would be subtracting the code of 0. Okay? So you get the number, the numeric value of this digit by subtracting 0 from the character and then you add it to the sum. That's basically that, uh, that task. Do that, implement that, it's good practice for um, for processing text and processing digits from text. Okay, so let's continue on. We solved this task and there's a solution we can check. Now another thing we need to uh, know about characters is that since there are special characters in code, we need to have ways of escaping them. For example, we can't create a letter directly in our code. We can't have a literal for the new line in our code. So we can't say letter equals uh, equals these apostrophes and between them we can't press enter like this. Because this is a new line but the code doesn't support that. It can be a space, that's fine, but it can support an, an actual new line. It also can support the tab symbol. It can only support uh, the space and normal symbols. Okay, so how do we create literals for, for example, new line? Or for stuff like, how do we create the letter, apostro uh, the symbol apostrophe? So let's call this a symbol. We can't just place three apostrophes here because apostrophe simply means uh, a character begins here. So how do you render an apostrophe inside uh, a character? How do you write the literal for an apostrophe. Well, for such, for such special cases, we have the so-called escaping of characters, or this is a way of saying that the following symbol will not be a part of the code, like char is a part of the code and symbol is a part of the code, and this apostrophe is a part of the code. Inside these apostrophes, slash followed by a symbol means render that symbol. So this is not a part of the code because if I just enter a single apostrophe, well, it treats it as a part of the code and it gets confused. Okay, as, as part of the Java code, I mean. And it gets confused because it doesn't know what I'm telling it. But now I'm telling it, okay, listen here, I want you to add this symbol as a symbol. I'm not typing in code over here, I'm typing in the actual symbol. And there are such escaping symbols for a lot of things. For example, new line is escaped like this. If you want to have a character that represents the new line symbol, you write backslash n. And if you have, if you want a character rep which represents the tab symbol, you write backslash t. That means the tab symbol. And if you want a character which is the default value of a character, which is the so-called no terminator, which is the, this thing is equal to just uh, the value of zero casted to a char. So this and this are completely equal. They're the, the, the same thing. So the character code zero and this way of representing the character code zero are the same. So there's escaping for this. And guess how you uh, add a backslash into a symbol? because now you know that backslash means something special. Well, how do you escape a backslash? With a backslash. So double backslash means single backslash if you're saving it, if you're uh, writing a character literal in your code. This only uh, applies to your code. If you're reading from the code, so characters are just characters. But since in code, apostrophes mean something and quotes mean something and uh, slashes mean something, there's escaping for them in your code, only in your code. So that's what escaping is. So if you want to uh, enter an apostrophe, you do it like this. If you want to enter a quote, if it's for a character, you can do it like this. But if it's for a string, you need to do it 
with a backslash or you can do it always with a backslash if you're if you're unsure backslash and quotes just means quotes and quotes work inside uh, character quotes inside apostrophes like this but if you if you have a string well, the the rules change and then since strings if you have a string uh, message which equals hello well a string is surrounded by quotes scans you can't add a quote over here because it confuses the code and it doesn't understand it thinks that the strings end here the string ends here and then you have some other code after that and in, in order for it not to treat this as the closing quote for a string, you just write a backslash in front of it. And that would print the text H-E-L and then quotes and then L-O. Okay, so let's print this. System.out.print print line, print the message and print this symbol. And let's make the symbol be a backslash and to make it be a backslash we need to write double backslash and start this code we will see what I uh, described earlier we will see the HEL apostrophe L um, HEL quote LO and then the backslash if you don't do the escaping you get compile time error compilation errors because here it sees okay this is a closing quote and it thinks that the message is hell and after that there's some low variable which we've added and for the symbol it thinks that this apostrophe isn't the closing apostrophe why well because uh because it sees a backslash over here and the backslash means the sec the next symbol isn't a part of the code hence it's missing something here so if we want just a backslash we have to write two backslashes okay and here if we want a quote we need to write a backslash quote same goes here for backslashes if you want to render a backslash inside this hello string you need a double backslash so launching this we will see h backslash el quote lo h backslash el quote lo now if this is confusing where you need to add a backslash and where you don't just play around with it. it it takes some time getting used to but it's not very complicated and there's a list of other escaping uh, symbols you can also do this backslash u meaning unicode and then the hexadecimal representation representation of uh, a unicode code point and that would allow you to render any character over there okay so uh, the, here are some literals and what they look like when printed on the console. You can play around with these if you want. Uh, here are the tab symbols. Here are some uh, traditional Chinese symbols. Here are, uh, a Unicode. Uh, here's a Unicode letter, which is just the letter O represented in Unicode. And you can play around with these values a bit so you can get used to them. Okay, so the last part we need to talk about are strings. So, strings are just sequences of characters. Just like we had this character data type, well, there's a string data type which represents a sequence of characters like this. So, the string data type message over here, each of its symbols is actually a character. One character variable for each symbol. It, well, not. The, depending on what language you're using, it might not be one character for each symbol, but it will mostly be one character for each symbol. So, the string keyword is what it what it creates, and if you don't initialize it, it has a value of no, but this, again, this default value we will meet when we get to the lesson about arrays. So, up until this point, you can ignore this no thing, which we've entered here. And you always write string literals in quotes. That's why you have to escape the quote character. We've seen those already. And one thing we can do with them, except represent uh, symbols and read from the console and parse them into numbers, is concatenate them using the plus operator. So you can do, if you have a message, if you have the message hello, and then you say uh, print on the console the message plus space plus world, this will print on the console hello world because it will attach this space to the end of hello and then it will attach world to the end of this space and this will print hello world on the console okay so if we're uh, 
printing uh, a file name with a string, we need to keep in mind that we need to add the double quote. So if we're initializing it inside code, so by the way, here's the hello world. If we're initializing a, a file path inside code like this, then we need to escape this is called escaping, whoops, we got a double. Uh, we need to escape each slash, for example, in a Windows file path, with uh, another slash. So, so if you see a backslash, you add another backslash in it. If, if you want a character literal di directly. So if you're writing this inside your code, you want to be doing escaping. If you're reading it from the console, you don't need to be doing anything. You can read directly from the console because the console isn't Java code. Whereas this is Java code, and to order that Java code to render a backslash, you just need to type two backslashes for it. Now, we've already seen what else there is here for uh, using strings. We've already seen the string.format function. Uh, if we want to, in addition to concatenating strings, we can use the string.format function to, to get a string built from a few different pieces. So instead of uh, concatenating these uh, with a space like I did previously, like I did over here when I said message plus space plus uh, wrote, instead of printing like that, I can Create a mess. Create a string which is string formatted, which equals string dot format. What do you what do you want me to format? Well, I want you to format two strings one after another with a space between them. Okay, so one string, a second string, a space between them, and here I can supply my message and this world string I want printed. And now if I if I say print this formatted thing on the console, I will get hello and space and world printed out. We've seen this already. Oops, what did I get? I, I didn't get hello, I got the message from uh, this uh, escaped Windows path. But that's still a good example of what happens when you're escaping paths. Uh, these double slashes became single slashes because they're inside my Java code. Okay, so this is how you format these strings, how you can uh, build them as a single entity, or instead of using format, if it's something more simple, like it's in this case, it's just a space separated, uh, space separated strings, you can just add that space separation through concatenation. Okay, so that's one thing you can uh, do with strings, uh, and here's an example of how you can print the first name and the last name of a person and that into a string. So this formats a string, generates the full name from the first name and the last name, and then prints that into another format in which the string is at the last place. This is just playing around with formatting strings. It's not something very advanced in comparison to what we've already done. And if you uh, want, you can also use the screen, string concatenation not just on strings, you can use them on strings and numbers. So if I have, for example, uh, an int age which is 42 and if I have a string name which is um, the answer, because the answer to the universe and everything is 42, okay? So if I print now name plus space plus age, this will convert 42 into a string and we'll print it on the console. So strings are pretty <coughs> convenient to work, in, work with on, in Java. We don't need to do anything special, we just concatenate them with pluses and they just work. Okay, so we have a task in which we have two names entered on the console as single lines and we need to combine them with a the separator. Okay, we can do this in a few ways. Let's do that and do it in the easiest way, which would be string first name. Get that from the scanner next line, since we've been told that these are on separate lines. Get that from the next line from the scanner, and then get the last name from the next line of the scanner. And then what do we need to do? We need to get the separator. Well, string. Actually, they call it a delimiter here, not separator. Okay, so let's call it a delimiter. And get that from the console. Okay. 
And now, how do we print this joint with that delimiter? Well, we just say system.out.print and we concatenate these three strings. So we concatenate first name with the delimiter followed by last name and that would print our string on the console. Let's see it, if it works. So this thing is waiting for me to enter uh, two names. So let's say I'm George Georgiev and it's waiting for the delimiter. Let's say that the delimiter is money because we all like money. Okay, so we got George Georgiev with the delimiter of three dollar signs. And that works because strings can be concatenated easily one after the other. Okay. And we can test around with the other delimiter, but we won't play around with that now. The point of this uh, uh, demonstration of strings was to show how strings uh, function in Java. Uh, and they're pretty easy to use. We can uh, concatenate them using plus. We can also concatenate them using uh, string.concat, which just accepts the parameter for the string to concatenate with. So this could have been first name dot concat with the limiter dot concat with last name and each of these operations produces a new string so string dot oops string dot uh, concat with this delimiter will produce a new string on which we call concat and add the next name and this we can replace the plus code with this concat code and it would do the same thing now another thing which uh, strings have in them which is useful uh, and which we haven't really covered in this lecture is if we say want to iterate each symbol of a string what we can do is start a for loop starting from zero and continuing onto let's create a string s over here which is hello we can start uh, we can create a for loop which starts from zero and continues up until s dot length gives us the length of this string and on each iteration of this for loop we can do system.out.println of s dot give me the character at that index. Now this accesses each of the characters of the string, which is uh, a note back to that task I made up for you to do at home if you're uh, into it, of filtering out which symbols in a string are digits and summing them up. Well you'd be doing that with something like this. You'd be iterating the string until you reach its length and reading each of its characters by doing as dot give me the character at that position. So this is a character. This is the current character. And printing that current character on the console in our case would just print H, E, L, L, O, each on a separate line. But if you want to do something more special, you could, for example, like the task I mentioned, do a check like if character dot is, uh, um, is digit, if the current character is digit, then, and guess what, you in that task which I uh, offered you a few moments ago, you would be checking if this is a digit, and then if it is a digit, you would be converting it into a number by uh, subtracting z the character code of zero from it and then adding it into a sum. Okay, so this is how you walk the characters of a string and this is how you can do some operations with that. Now, there's of course a lot more to uh, talk about uh, regarding strings. We will have a separate lecture uh, about tech, uh, a separate lesson about text processing further on, so don't worry about that. This is just an overview of the data type of string and how you can use it. We will, we will see a lot of other ways to use it and uh, modify strings and so on. But for now, we finished up our current lesson. We talked about variables. We talked that they are a way to store information, which can later be processed by the computer. We talked that there are different data types of variables and there are numeral types which represent integer floating point numbers and so on. Some of them uh, are very specific like the integers whereas floating point numbers aren't very accurate and calculations with them are fast but not uh, completely 100% on the mark uh, and if we want something to be 100% on the mark when calculating we can use stuff like big decimal 
Uh, we also talked about string and text types. We talked a lot about escaping and how you can convert symbols into, into numbers and back. And we played around with joining up and concatenating strings. And now we know that strings are just sequences of characters, which are Unicode characters, which represent pretty much any language you can think of. So we now know data types, and we can uh, use these data types in our programs, understanding how they function. So I hope this was useful for you. And of course, if you have any questions, please ask them in the channels we have provided for you. And well, until next time, bye bye. Did you like this lesson? Do you want more? Join the Werner's community at softuni.org. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more free video tutorials on coding and software development. Get free access to the practical exercises and the automated judge system for this coding lesson and many others. Get free help from mentors and meet other learners. Join now, it's free. softuni.org.